Sir Walter Raleigh, the polymath of the Elizabethan age, was not only an organizer and champion of England's first attempt to establish a colony in the New World, but also a sailor, explorer, courtier, writer, philosopher, and poet who achieved near-mythic status after his death. Born into a cash-strapped yet respected family in the West Country, Raleigh attended Oxford but secretly fought in France against Catholic persecution of Protestants, earning a reputation as a brave soldier and adventurer. Raleigh's half-brother, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, held a royal patent to colonize North America and convinced Raleigh to join him on a voyage, sparking Raleigh's desire to establish colonies for his own land. Joining an expedition to Ireland in 1580, Raleigh quickly became a brutal and effective soldier, catching the attention of Queen Elizabeth I and earning him enemies among the gentlemen in her court. As a token of appreciation for his efforts in quelling the uprising in Ireland and as a way to counteract the influence of other courtiers, Queen Elizabeth generously bestowed upon Walter Raleigh vast estates in Ireland, as well as exclusive rights to collect considerable amounts of money from the Irish population who worked on his lands or engaged in trade. With his financial security secured, Raleigh was further honored with the prestigious title of Sir Walter when he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth in 1585. Having witnessed the failure of Gilbert Humphrey's attempt to establish an English colony in Newfoundland, Raleigh seized the opportunity to persuade the Queen to grant him the license to colonize North America for England. Raleigh's motive for establishing colonies in the New World was to target the Spanish treasure fleets, as he envisioned English bases that could intercept and seize the vast riches that were fueling the Spanish Empire, a plan that intrigued Queen Elizabeth. In 1584, Sir Walter Raleigh obtained permission to explore the North American coast for a suitable site of a permanent English settlement, leading to the first Roanoke expedition. Unwilling to leave London, he dispatched an expedition to examine the Outer Banks region, believing it to be an ideal location for launching raids against the Spanish. Despite receiving favorable reports, Raleigh chose not to go himself for fear of damaging his position at court. Raleigh enlisted his cousin, Sir Richard Grenville, to establish a permanent colony named Virginia in honor of Queen Elizabeth. But due to conflicts with the natives, many colonists returned to England while a few stayed behind. Raleigh then organized another expedition led by John White to support the remaining settlers. When Governor White returned to the struggling settlement in North America in 1590, all he found were dismantled houses, fortifications, and the mysterious word Croatoan carved into a fence post, leaving the fate of Raleigh's colony forever uncertain. Raleigh's secret marriage to Elizabeth Throckmorton, one of the Queen's ladies-in-waiting, led to his falling out of favor with Queen Elizabeth. Summoned to Elizabeth's presence in August 1592, Raleigh was given the secret task of dividing the spoils captured by an English fleet from the Spanish, a challenging mission that required satisfying both the English captains and the Spanish who wanted their treasure back. In 1593, Despite being disliked by the Queen, Raleigh managed to win a seat in Parliament and leave the Tower to live in his estate at Sherborne, where he gained a reputation as a respected gentleman. Although his outspoken religious views offended some, he became a naval affairs expert in Parliament. Raleigh embarked on an expedition to find the mythical city of gold, known as El Dorado, based on Spanish accounts, which led him to explore Venezuela and Guyana, 
ultimately publishing a fictionalized account of his journey that established him as a renowned explorer. After being wounded in the English expedition to Cadiz, Raleigh recovered in time to join the failed expedition to the Azores and later played a significant role in defending England against the Spanish Armada. Despite Raleigh's numerous contributions to Queen Elizabeth, she maintained a distant relationship with him, even after granting him various rewards and titles due to his marriage and rumors spread by his enemies in court, which worsened as the Queen aged. During the early 17th century, Raleigh took on the role of Governor of Jersey, where he utilized his military and naval expertise to fortify the island, making it nearly impenetrable to enemies. Despite his accomplishments, Queen Elizabeth refused to acknowledge him publicly, influenced by courtiers who viewed him as ambitious and risky. In 1602, Raleigh regained favor with Queen Elizabeth and expressed his gratitude appropriately. But after her death in 1603, he and others considered who would inherit the throne, leading to a plot to remove James VI of Scotland and award the crown to Arbella Stuart, allegedly funded by agents of the Spanish king. Raleigh faced treason charges for his alleged involvement in the main plot, a conspiracy to deny the throne to James VI and I. During his trial for treason, Sir Walter Raleigh acted as his own attorney and attempted to challenge the validity of a confession given by one of the conspirators, but was denied the opportunity to call him as a witness, leading to his conviction and death sentence. During his imprisonment, Sir Walter Raleigh, who was initially sentenced to death, found solace in writing, producing religious and political tracts, poetry, and a significant historical work titled The History of the World, where he challenged the concept of divine rights of kings and monarchical governments. Despite facing a death sentence, Raleigh managed to aggravate the king even further with his historical writings, which focused on ancient civilizations and offered advice to the current monarch, much to James's displeasure. During his time in the Tower, Raleigh wrote personal poetry that reflected his own experiences and emotions, ranging from short ditties to long classical poems reminiscent of Edmund Spencer and John Donne. This allowed him to maintain his fame and keep his accomplishments in the public eye while imprisoned. Accompanied by his family and a team of dedicated servants, Sir Walter Raleigh utilized his knowledge of an underground network in London to spread rumors about his discovery of valuable resources in Guyana and Venezuela successfully persuading the king and his ministers to support another expedition for the benefit of the kingdom. Through his persuasive writings and poetry, Raleigh played a significant role in perpetuating the belief in the fabled city of El Dorado and its untold riches, ultimately leading him to propose a South American expedition to the king in hopes of acquiring gold that had not yet fallen into the hands of the Spanish or Portuguese, which was crucial for the British king due to the vulnerability of English settlements to Spanish ships and the need for peace with Spain to support the growing English colonial empire. In the early 17th century, Sir Walter Raleigh proposed a plan to King James VI and I for an English expedition to explore the Guiana region, with the intention of establishing a presence there, supported by colonies in the Caribbean and North America. However, the English monarch was concerned about the reaction of the Spanish and Portuguese, so it was made clear that the expedition must not pose a threat or engage in defensive operations against them, but rather, act as guests. 
After being pardoned and released from the tower in 1617, King James VI and I granted Sir Walter Raleigh permission to lead an expedition to find the mythical city of El Dorado, which he had helped create the fervor over during his imprisonment. During his second expedition to Guiana, Raleigh was joined by his longtime friend Lawrence Chemis, who had previously been imprisoned with him in the tower and had knowledge of a rich gold vein near the Orinoco River. This led to conflict with Spanish settlements. Accompanying his father and Chemis on the expedition, Sir Walter Raleigh's son Walter found himself in a hostile encounter with the Spanish at Santo Toma de Guayana, resulting in his unfortunate death. After a minor skirmish that involved some musket fire and a few casualties, Chemis and his crew took over Santo Tome for almost a month, desperately searching for gold that turned out to be a myth. With the Spanish closing in, they decided to loot the place and set it on fire before making a daring escape downriver to reunite with Raleigh, who was not in the best of moods after receiving news of his son's death. Upon reuniting with Sir Walter Raleigh, Chemis was met with a lack of support from his once close friend, leading to a realization that he had inadvertently condemned Raleigh to death. Overwhelmed by guilt, Chemis attempted to end his own life by shooting himself in the chest, and when that failed, resorted to stabbing his own heart with a knife, ultimately resulting in his demise. Knowing what awaited him, Raleigh returned to England after his failed expedition, only to discover that there were plans to bring him before the king and reinstate his death sentence, causing him to be ordered to London under escort, with a slight opportunity for escape. Raleigh made an attempt to escape from Stuckley, but was ultimately unsuccessful due to a lack of funds and the help of his captors. In London, Stuckley betrayed Raleigh by initially agreeing to help him escape, but then revealing his true intentions and ultimately leading to Raleigh's re-imprisonment in the Tower of London. As Raleigh made his way back to London from the Orinoco, he meticulously gathered evidence to defend himself against the Spanish allegations. He had copies of his orders forbidding aggression, records proving his absence during the attack, and testimonies from those involved stating the Spanish initiated the violence. Despite all this, Raleigh never got the opportunity to plead his case before the king or any court. While Sir Walter Raleigh was imprisoned in the tower and unable to defend himself, the Spanish, along with the French and others at court, exerted pressure on King James to execute him, despite his earlier conviction for conspiring with Spain. Raleigh was denied a trial, yet significant evidence was brought forth against him, both directly to the king and through public platforms, including knowledge of plots to flee to France and wage war against England. Despite the lack of substantiation and absence of a court hearing, this unchallenged evidence tainted Raleigh's reputation as false reports from his enemies swayed public opinion against him. Sir Walter Raleigh faced his executioner on the scaffold where he denied the charges of high treason, forgave his enemies, and was beheaded by Axe on October 29, 1618. Despite being only partially embalmed, Sir Walter Raleigh's head was given a Christian burial, while the rest of his body was laid to rest in St. Margaret's at Winchester, where his tomb stands as a shrine today. Raleigh's head remained with his wife until her death, when it was finally reunited with his body in the grave. The question of his guilt in the crime for which he was executed has been debated for centuries with one of the judges involved in his trial expressing doubts about the justice of his condemnation. 
Sir Walter Raleigh's love for tobacco was undeniable, as he not only became an avid user but also championed its cultivation as a means to boost the English colony's financial success in North America, even leaving behind a tobacco pouch in his Tower of London cell with the inscription, It was my companion at that most miserable time. Sir Walter Raleigh, often seen as the embodiment of chivalry, displayed courtly manners while also maintaining a connection with the common people through his writings, leading a life filled with unlikely adventures, imprisonment, romantic relationships with the queen, and various roles such as a soldier, sailor, philosopher, poet, historian, explorer, and entrepreneur, making him a true swashbuckler of a bygone era.